Okay, welcome to the first joint Zoom meeting of the House Education and House Ways and Means Committees. And with our mutual interest in the funding of education, the Ways and Means Chair and I thought a joint meeting might be more efficient use of time and resources, particularly of those that we've invited to provide testimony. I know the House Education Committee has an interest in better understanding how COVID-19 disruption is affecting the funding of education. And that's for the remainder of 2020, as well as building budgets and setting the tax rates for 2021. Representative Ansel, you want to say anything? Yeah, thank you, Kate. So, and thank you for um, uh, working with me and setting this up. This is the first joint meeting that we've done on Zoom. And um, it'll be interesting because we've got 31 participants. It's a little more than we usually have. Um, but as we've been working through the education finance issues, the um, needs of the schools and the way this um, pandemic is affecting um, students and affecting schools, which is really the um, expertise and jurisdiction of the education committee um, is so closely related to the finance issues, which we generally do on ways and means that it made sense to have a common, um, ha have some uh, understanding in common and some testimony in common. So um, that's why we're doing this. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, start unless anybody, um, and just be aware for the committee members, um, we're going to try to recognize you, raise your hand when you have a question, um, and um, we'll pause every so often to give people a chance to jump in. Um, and we will start this with Mark Peralt, who has been in our committee several times on this issue. Um, and uh, welcome, to, welcome to our uh, Zoom uh, meeting here, Mark. Well, th thank you. Um, can, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, earlier today, I sent over um, three documents to um, Sorsha and Avery. Uh, I think those are going to be posted on the committee web pages. I'm mentioning it now because I mean, the amount of time we have, I'm going to basically hit the highlights here as I go through um, this presentation. If you want more detailed information, you can start looking there, or you can always reach out to uh, either Chloe Wexler or me um, anytime, and with any questions you might have. So um, I think the best way for this to work um, efficiently might be for, um, I'm not sure who, who's controlling the uh, screen, but if the education fund outlook I sent over could be posted for people to take a look at, I think it would be, it would be facilitate this presentation if people were looking at that. Is that possible? Avery, Avery can pull that up. I'm going to pull that up. Just give me one moment. Okay. What, what I'll do while Avery's pick, pulling that up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you where we think we're going to be ending up 2020 in, and then talk a little bit about the uh, issues that the House Ways and Means Committee is having to wrestle with in terms of setting the property tax parameters for FY21. So, uh, great. So, can everybody see this? Yes? Good. Okay, so um, on, this, on this balance sheet, if you take a look at the middle column, which is labeled FY 2020 January forecast, that's, that's pretty much where we were prior to this COVID-19 outbreak rolling through. So um, in order just to cut to the chase, if you could scroll down to the bottom, Avery, on this sheet. And um, what I'm going to just show you here is that prior, prior to this crisis erupting, the education fund was actually in pretty good shape um, fiscally. Um, if you take a look at line um, 26, or I'm sorry, line 27, you can see that we had a full stabilization reserve of about $36.4 million. That was a full 5% reserve. And then on top of that, if you look down on line 31, you can see we were anticipating that we were going to close FY 2020 with a $12.9 million surplus. So there was about $50 million in, in, in the fund that wasn't being used to support um, education services in 2020. Now, however, if you move over to the next column um, over, um, can you, can you uh, roll to the top of that, um, Avery? And maybe more of it on there. Yeah, I guess that's far enough. You, you can see on line nine, 
And this will be the only change to the sources and uses portions of this outlook. You can see that there's negative $40 million showing up on line nine. Now the current forecast for the um, consumption taxes that are paid into the education fund, which includes the sales and use tax, the purchase and use tax, and the meals and rooms tax collectively are now expected to go be from 35 to $45 million below where we thought they were going to be back when the forecast was done in January. So that's a significant drop. It's understandable. Consumption taxes are the first to go down when something like this happens. Um, that's a pretty broad range. That's because it's very difficult, even in 2020, to estimate what the revenue impact is going to be. So for the purpose of the balance sheet, we picked $40 million, which is the midpoint of the revenue estimate um, for the losses. So that's the only difference that's showing up there on sources. Now, if, can you, uh, Avery, can you um, scroll down um, to the bottom of the sheet? So you can see here again on line, on line 21, um, total education fund uses, we've assumed that there's no change there. I can come back and talk a little bit about that if we have time, but for this purpose, just assume no changes in spending, a 35 to $45 million loss in um, education fund revenues due to this downturn. And then if you go to the bottom of the sheet on the lines that I just went to, you can see what the consequence is. On line 27, you can see that the stabilization reserve that was full at 5% has now dropped from 36 million down to about 9.3. Given the range of the estimates, that could be $5 million higher, you know, um, or it could be $5 million lower. But what it tells me is that under any scenario, we're going to be going into FY21 with an education fund that has a very diminished stabilization reserve. We're going, going in with the covered empty, basically. That 9.3%, uh, that $9.3 million reserve estimate is only 1.3% of prior year appropriations. That number should be about 5%, so around something around $38 million. So we've taken a pretty good hit. And then just to wrap up on this, if you look down at line 31, you can see that that $12.9 million surplus we were anticipating is just gone. So that, that's the situation we're looking at right now um, in FY 2020. Um, keep in mind that the non-property tax revenues only account for one third of the total revenues and the remaining two thirds are education property tax revenues. We're not too worried about those revenues at this point because at this point in the year, most of those monies have already been collected by municipalities and they're in the bank. Now there's a handful of communities that still have half of the amount of education tax revenue that they need to collect for 2020 still outstanding. So for those individual communities, it may be an issue, but um, overall, it's not really an education fund issue. Um, in the more detailed analysis that will be available online, you can see a table that indicates that about $132 million in education uh, property tax money is still outstanding for 2020 but that's spread out over a lot of towns. Um, and it's not a significant amount of money for most of them, but there are 25 municipalities that bill twice a year, still on half outstanding. Um, Mark, so let me, why don't I pause and see if sure. members have questions. Um, because I'm scrolling through the list here and mm -hmm. I don't see anybody. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so um, going into FY 2021, the loss of non-property tax revenues due to those consumption taxes is expected to be even more severe. And we don't know how long it's gonna go on for. Um, in addition, timely collection of property tax revenues is uncertain because we're gonna have, employees are gonna be out of work. Businesses are gonna have closed down. Employers are gonna be reining in on discretionary spending. So we just expect more of a downturn in the non-property tax revenues, but that may also spill over into the collection of the education property taxes. If you're unemployed and your property tax becomes due in July or August, you may not be able to pay it. At this point in time, we're just basically in the dark. We have no reliable estimates as to what revenues are gonna look like next year. 
as we speak, Tom Cravette, Jeff Carr, and some other people are working on revenue forecasts for next year. They're taking into account evolving epidemiological studies that are gonna to try to give them some sense of how long and how deep any recession that's gonna arise from this crisis will take to roll out. Until we know that, trying to do an FY21 education fund outlook is highly speculative. So we just haven't done it. And that's why on the sheet that I just presented to you for the first time, FY21 is not on there. Now we do know a lot about what's going on in FY21 otherwise. We know that um, at town meeting, an additional $73 million in education spending for FY21 was approved by voters. Um, so there's a, there's a significant amount of money in there. Now, even if, even if it were possible to do something um, to try to constrain costs next year, it's gonna be very difficult because um, school spending is primarily salaries and benefits. It's about 80% of the total. And those benefits and salaries are under contract with the teachers unions and the school boards. So um, it would be very difficult for them to find savings in the, in the appropriations that they've already made for FY21 without going to a reduction in force or something like that, which is not a desirable outcome in the middle of a recession. So in terms of the money, amount of money we need next year, there's not a whole lot of flexibility. Um, so normally the legislature sets um, the property tax yields prior to adjournment. And prior to this COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic hitting, that's what House Ways and Means was working on. Given the level of uncertainty that I've described now in terms of how we're leaving um, FY20 and what, situ what shape we'll be in there, plus the revenue uncertainty looking forward to FY21, it's almost impossible at this point to, to figure out where those yields ought to be set. There, are, there is a default if the yields aren't set in current law. There's also been some talk about just staying with the January yields that were announced. I mean, the December yields that were announced by the tax commissioner earlier this year. Both of those have you know, problems associated with them. The latter one may be a little better because um, when school boards were putting together their budgets and when town when voters went to town meeting to vote, those are the those are the tax rate parameters they had in mind. But there's no constraint on where the legislature can set those. But at, at this point, given that we just don't know what the bottom line would look like, it's really difficult to, to talk about how you might do that. Mark, um, what, Mark, I've got a couple people with questions. Let me let them jump in. Scott sure. and then George. Hey, Mark. Um, does JFO or anybody else have any kind of analysis as to what percentage of these homestead or no or non homestead property taxpayers that their payments are made through escrow? Um, I, I believe that the uh, the Jill Remick at the tax at the property valuation review probably knows that I can check in with her and get back to you. Okay, thank you because that can make a big difference as far as whether they get paid or not. Yeah, I, I think she does know that because she was raising the issue about, you know, with the timing of the bills and everything like that, she was afraid it was going to cause a problem with the banks. So I'll, I'll follow up on that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank, thanks, Mike. No, too. Um, yeah. uh, George. Yeah, hi, Mark. Is there any way to know what that Ed Fund Outlook page would look like if we were successful in finding a way to use the federal money, the secondary education emergency uh, fund relief? Yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to get to that now. That was my next topic. And there's, there's an issue there about, you know, is that money FY 2020 money? Is it FY 21 money? Is it split? There are a lot of unanswered questions. So maybe if I go through, you know, what the money we have, we can, we can touch on that a little bit after I get through how much, how much we do have, because you're right. Um, and is that, was that all the questions? Cause I, I'll move That's on. That's all the now. questions that I've got. So yes, go, yeah, go okay. ahead. So the, white, the one bright spot, we, the federal stimulus bill passed on the 27th and Vermont's allocation of the $30.7 billion for elementary and secondary education is $13.1 million. So it's a big chunk of change. And if it was used in FY 2020, it would go up some way towards you know, closing some of that gap. Mark, um, it was 30, right? It, I heard 13, 30. Whoa, it is. 13, I, well, 13. Hold on a second, I may have uh, 30. 
I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> it made me nervous. <laughs> yes, me too. All right. A type, a typo. Um, it's $31 million. Thank you. Oh, and that would go a long way toward closing the gap in 2020. The 13 million would not. Yeah. But um, anyway, so we're, we're anticipating $31.1 million. We have a month to apply for it. They have a month to give it back to us. So it's coming relatively soon. Um, the way that works, however, is that money is paid to the agency of education and then sent directly out to school districts. So it bypasses the education fund entirely. We had a similar issue um, back in 2010 and 2011 when we were receiving era money from the Great Recession. We got $18 million each of two years, money that went directly to school districts. The way we addressed it then was we reduced the general fund transfer to the education fund by the same amount. We no longer have a general fund transfer to the education fund. We have dedicated revenues. So I'm not sure even if, that was, even if we wanted to go that route exactly how you do it. The other possibility is you could let this, we're, we're not gonna get this money. Can, we possibly may not receive this money until late May or um, I guess, April, no, late June, I guess. So it could, could be up to two months. We're getting really close to the end of the fiscal year anyways. If that money were held and distributed to schools entirely in FY21, it would show up as an offsetting revenue. And what that means is that schools would set, well, they've already set them, they, they have budgets they could reduce those budgets by the amount of offsetting revenue, this federal aid that comes in, and that would lower education spending and you know, work its way back to the education fund. These are all questions that this is, this is me spitballing. I have no I haven't talked to anybody about this and I have no idea um, where people wanna go on it, but we're just trying to figure out how to, so how to sort of wrestle with this issue that we've got coming forward without having any idea whether we've got a gigantic problem or something that's more manageable. So um, I think the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, in the memo, and I won't go over them today unless you want me to, given the amount of time we have, but the issues that I've discussed raise a number of, is of other issues. One is potential cash flow concerns, not just for the education fund, but for municipalities and school districts as well. You'll remember that you know, municipalities essentially act as agents for the state and collect both the municipal property tax and the education property tax. A lot of complications arise around that. Most of them we're working through uh, with the tax department. Nothing, you know, no showstoppers that we found at least at this point. Um, another problem that was mentioned earlier, I think is the scheduling of votes or re-votes for school budgets that um, haven't yet passed them. I noted that um, South Burlington that failed to pass their budget initially had scheduled a revote, which is now postponed indefinitely. So um, there's not a whole lot of towns out there. I think nine towns failed to pass their budgets and there was probably another half a dozen that were scheduled to vote at a later date. But I, I don't know how they're gonna be able to vote um, given we have a stay at home order in place. Um, the impact of moving the personal income tax filing from July 15th I mean, from April 15th to July 15th impacts the homestead declaration, the property tax credit claim, those kind of things. But again, um, we're working with the tax department. It may be, the solution may be as simple as asking towns to move back their billing dates to August 1st. Um, then towns could, and towns could choose, issue your bills per normal and know you're gonna have to reissue bills at some point or wait until after August 1st when you have all the information and send them out then. That's a decision that could be could be left to the towns, not necessarily have to have the legislature get involved. And the last thing, and this is an important one, but it's sort of a catch, it doesn't fit into any of my other categories, is the property tax adjustment for it's going to be paid to taxpayers in FY21. That property tax adjustment is not going to reflect people's income in 2020. So any income related, any COVID-19 related loss of income is gonna reduce your household income, but you're only gonna be compensated for that on the education tax in FY22. In FY21, you're gonna get, it's already, it's already been basically calculated, we know what it is, and it was determined based on your situation prior to COVID-19 hitting. Um, that'll have a ripple effect out in 22 when people who have lost their jobs, lost income, 
and are entitled to a much bigger adjustment will be able to claim it at that point. One thing that may mitigate that a little bit is to the extent that people are getting unemployment benefits, um, checks from the federal government um, in order to help them through this, all that's counted as household income. We define household income really broadly. So that would be included. So um, unless you have any questions or want to get into any more detail, um, I think I I'll stop one. there. I've got one here, Peter Conlon. Uh, thanks, uh, Mark. The um, $31 million in the uh, federal aid mm -hmm. uh, that goes directly to LEAs, um, yep. is that contingent on the school districts showing that they've got unexpected higher than normal expenses? No, and that you know, well, sure. no, yeah, and that raises a good issue that I sort of glided over. Um, we have very little control over that money, um, other than when it goes out the door. Um, it, it goes out to individual, and it goes out to not districts, but it goes out to supervisory unions. And the amount that goes out to supervisory unions is determined by a federal formula. So we'll be able to know exactly how much is going out. But uh, my understanding is that that money is intended to deal with. COVID-19 related costs, but the way the uses is defined, and we did go over this in a little more detail in House Ways and Means yesterday, the, um, the allowable uses of that money is very, very broad. I think they can use it for pretty much almost anything. Um, apart from COVID-19, the first line of the legislation says you can use it for anything that you can use education and secondary um, money from for. for. So I, I think it's pretty broad. Did, did that answer your question? Did I get sidetracked? Yeah, he says it's okay. That's okay. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, good. Did you have anything else, Mark, that you wanted to go over? Um, no, not not at this point. Um, if you want to see the um, detail on the um, federal aid, that's one of the documents that I sent over to, to Sorsha and Avery, so you can take a look at that. It's a little bit more complicated than I've described here, and there's a little bit more money available. But I haven't discussed it because it's basically a, an emergency fund that's um, that the governor has discretion over as to how it's used. But there is that money in there. It's for severe severe problems, I think. And there is higher ed money in here as well, which I didn't talk at all about. But um, other than that, um, I think that's it. Good. Thank you. Let me pause for a second and see if anyone has questions. I don't see anybody. Um, so Brad, um, welcome to our, our joint meeting. Um, and one, a couple of things that I was hoping you would address. One is a very sort of general question about what you're hearing um, from school boards, just sort of um, generally are they, you know, is it likely they're gonna spend more money, less money, um, you know, what is happening, particularly with the school boards that haven't adopted budgets. Um, and the other question, um, and I don't know that you have this information, but I think we would find really helpful is to know how this federal money that's gonna be allocated according to the ESEA formula, if, if it's possible to know what that actually means in terms of dollars to different districts, um, I think we would find that useful to see. Um, so I don't know that you came prepared with that, but um, if you could tell us um, if that's something we could get, that would be good. Um, yes, I mean, basically what, what the allocation is to us from the Fed, or from, from once we get the money from the feds, that rough, roughly 31 million, we still don't know exactly what the number is. Um, once we get that, it gets allocated out to the school district. Well, I shouldn't say the school district. It gets allocated out to the supervisor unions who in turn will push it out to the school districts um, <clears throat> based on the current year Title I allocation. Mm -hmm. So we're basically we're looking at that. I'm off the top of my head, I think our Title I is around maybe 34 million this year. So we're talking about 31 million roughly from the feds. There's a 10% that, that the agency can withhold for to use for emergency, well, they call it emergency situations in the language of the CARES Act, but for whatever we think it needs to be used for. So that, if you say that's around 28 million, my guess would be probably they're gonna get about 80% of what they're getting currently for the Title I allocation, just as a rough ballpark figure so they can start thinking about it. Okay. Um, that's that's kind of about as far as I've gotten with that. Again, without knowing exactly what we're gonna get, I can't, can't do the calculations, 
Um, I don't want to jump ahead of, of where Secretary French is either, because um, I, I don't know everything that he said about this. But that's that's my understanding from it. Um, the uh, just a few things from what Mark said about what the money can be used for. I do agree. I think it's pretty broad. I I'm, I'm not sure if you all looked at the act, the um, CARES Act itself or not. It lists 12 things that money can be used for. Some of them are fairly broad. The ones Mark was talking about, the um, ESEA and, and um, IDA, th those are actually pretty specific um, cost centers that they can, that those can be used for. But other things do flat, uh, allow more, much more flexibility. Some of the other things that they listed in the um, in the language that they put out there. Um, in terms of what the school districts are doing, more money, less money. At this point, we could, we can break that into two things. I was at I was talking to Senate um, Education and Senate Health and Welfare earlier today. <clears throat> they were kind of asking some of the same questions about that. And, and in terms of in terms of um, in terms of um, the districts who have not passed budgets yet and or who have not voted a budget yet, um, there's a lot of concern among business managers. And I've been talking to business managers, not the school boards directly. Um, there's there's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of worry about the from those business managers as to whether their budgets are going to be able to be passed or not. Um, an example would be the one in, in in Slate Valley, which used to be Fairhaven Union High School in that Ad or Addison Rutland district. <clears throat> um, they they're pretty certain that their their budget went down because of the bond. Um, and I think Bill, you mentioned this when I was in Ways and Means last. You agreed with that. Um, the, but their their education spending for people was up just under three percent, and they're not sure that will pass anymore um, with the with what's going on now. So again, there's a lot of concern both with people who have not had a budget vote yet and those who did fail. There's also some talk that I've heard. Um, more questions than, than serious consideration, and maybe other people know more than I do about this. But about, they, I've been asked the question a couple of times: if a vote has already, if a district has already voted its budget, can it revote that budget? And the answer is yes, they can. The school board can bring that back um, wow. un, under current statute if they so choose. I think they would have to be very careful about that because I think it could go south pretty fast. In terms of in terms of the um, the school the school board, no. There's a for this is the in, in that reconsideration language in Title 17, I, Title 17, 2661 subsection A. Um, it says that the voters can have 30 days to bring it back after the after the budget is, is approved, but the board can warn a special meeting whenever when they so choose. So I think I, I mean I think ledge councils look at that, and make sure that I'm interpreting that correctly. But the language is pretty clear to me as I read it, and, and the Sue's right there too. So I don't know if she's looking at Sue Um So I I think that's one thing that people might want to look at um, in terms of what's happening this year for everybody. It looks like their costs are going up. Um, I, I was kind of canvassing business managers yesterday, and a couple of the, the handouts that I, that I got quite belatedly to Sorsha and Avery um, are kind of just a quick compilation of, of what the business managers were telling me. Um, they're not in any particular order. There's a lot of redundancy, especially in the first one, um, but it's kind of saying some of the issues that they're running into. And very few of them are talking about, well, you know, we're saving money here. Um, some of them think there might be a little bit of savings because they're not running buses for students. They are, most of them running buses, it sounds like for meals. So they're still paying, um, a lot of them have busing contracts that even though they're not using the buses, they're still paying the contracts. So they're, you know, it's, it's kind of all over the place, but nobody sounds like they're saving a lot of money there. I think a lot of people are spending more money. It varies from place to place. Some of the places they said that said they weren't spending a lot of additional funds on this right now. Um, are looking at thinking that if this keeps going on, then they will be spending a lot of money. So it's, it's starting to ramp up for them too. Um, so, it, so it is kind of all over the place right now. Um, in terms of next year, there's a lot of concern. There hasn't been much conversation with me about it. I've been trying to leave them alone as much as possible knowing how busy they are. Um, but I know that there is concern about next year because, that, well, there's also concern a little bit, let me come swing back to this year for a second. There's also some concern from some districts um, in terms of getting that last payment from the town. As Mark said, a lot of towns have collected that money, but not, not all. There are the towns that collect twice a year, the towns that collect four times a year. I still have one more tax 
tech name it's make that will be going to the school district and i know there are, i think about 70 towns to collect four times a year so there's some concern that the towns will not have the money to to pay them current statute says that if a town does not collect all the education funds and by the end of the fiscal year consider where we are right now by the end of the fiscal year they have to borrow money to make the school district whole so that's still in statute that's not changed so there's there's a there's a hard stop for them so the town the school districts theoretically should be okay in terms of education property tax that they have yet to receive um but again some are, some are concerned about that going again now jumping back to the, the fall this coming year fy21 I, again, I haven't heard a lot about it, as I said, but it sounds like it, it, it's going to be an issue um, depending on how this hits and how long it goes on in terms of both the ed fund, people coming out of work. I heard from a number of business managers that, I shouldn't say a number, but I heard from several business managers that a lot of spouses of their employees are losing their jobs and they are coming on to their, their the school district health insurance. That's gonna push costs up. Um, so there, there are things like that happening too. Um, what else do I have in the big picture? Um, I, have, I have a quick question about childcare, um, that where the this um, childcare for essential persons, how is that being paid for and what's the impact on schools? Right now, they're basically paying that out of their general fund. Um, they're, they're having, what, what I'm hearing is they're, you, initially when this information came out, they were mandated to provide it. Um, and, and one of Governor Scott's um, memos said that they, they will likely be reimbursed. It wasn't guaranteed, but they'll likely be reimbursed. Um, people are concerned about that. It's cost them, in some places, cost them quite a bit of money. They're having, they're having trouble getting people to volunteer because subsequently it was not, it was, became a voluntary uh, pr provision of, of this child care to presential, potential persons. So they're having some, some places having people having trouble getting people to volunteer to do it. Um, but they are incurring costs for it. In the, in the CARES Act, um, there is money that will be allowed as I think, I'm not, maybe confused conversations, I think maybe Mark said that we're not sure when that money is going to get here. One of the things we're not certain about with that money is when it does get here, how far back can it be used? Um, federal, federal money usually has some type of provision that it can only go back so far. So I'm not sure that the money whenever it does come can be pushed back to say mid-March. I don't, I don't know, that's, that's yet to be determined by the feds and they'll let us know. But if, that, if, the, if it can go back to mid-March, then, then that federal money should go a long way towards um, mitigating some of the things that a lot of people are doing. On the other hand, we were thinking of using it for fiscal 21. Right, and, and, that's, and so, so if, if, that was to if that was to happen, um, then, then that would just mean that everybody is, pick is incurring deficit um, un unless they are saving money. But my understanding is very few people, if anybody have really laid off anyone um, sure. or cut back on their hours, most people are doing their best to, to um, keep the people fully employed. Again, there's language in, in the CARES Act that says that some of the money is to keep people employed for existing employees, maintain employment. Um, but they're, they are, so far they're making things work, um, but, but the, their, their costs are, are adding up. Um, Mark, I have a question. Uh, who was that? That was Kate. That's Kate. <laughs> you should have because I'm hosting. I don't have. I don't have a little hand. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do the hand. <laughs> uh, go ahead, and then Mark wanted to jump in too. Yeah. Um, just, just a, a concern going forward, given that we have um, children who are not receiving education for a significant number of, of weeks we're anticipating some requests for co compensatory education. Um, we have teachers that are being paid right now because they're actually teaching. Um, is there thought at this point of how this will affect the ed fund in terms of providing uh, compensatory education for students, for the large number of students who there's the fear of regression and recruitment of learning? Um, I think I, I think I think what it will be will be a, a an additional hit to the ed fund um, because the school districts are required to to do this by the federal folks. Everything that's come out of the federal guidance has said that that you know they can provide 
special education services at, at a distance if whenever possible um, as best they can. Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously more nuanced than that. But um, it does say that they will have to look at uh, compensatory education afterwards, and if it's required, they will they will provide it. So that so it will be an additional cost, quite a lot likely. Uh, Mark, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to point out I don't, I don't have the information in front of me, and I can I can get it to you. But um, Stephanie Barrett let me know yesterday that um, she has identified four point three million dollars of federal money that should be available for childcare. Yes. So um, there, there is, is some, there is some is, money. Okay. Is is that is that is that separate from the um, the K twelve money in the CARES Act? I, I, I don't know. That's why I don't okay. have it in front of me. But uh, while I was doing this presentation, I got an email from Stephanie yesterday, just alerting me to the fact that she thought that there was some money available to deal with this. I'll, I'll email you. And okay. Get thanks. Information about it. Yeah. I guess in in sort of this conversation highlights the fact that we've got a troubled fiscal 20 to get through. And then we've got a really, really difficult fiscal 21. Um, and this conversation really underscores that. So we're gonna have a few bumps in the road on just getting through 20. Mm -hmm. um, other, mm -hmm. let me see, nobody else there. Okay, Brad, did you have more that you wanted to? I, I was gonna, I just wanna take a quick look at, I, again, I sent, I sent you two handouts. One was just something I really was throwing together this afternoon about five minutes before this started. Um, and it was a lot of the comments of what business managers had said were some of their costs, what they're driving, what they were doing and stuff like that. It's, I think there are like, like 43 of them. There are some of the repeats. It's just, I just kind of cut and paste it as what I did. They're, they're not in any particular order, but if you want to scan through it. The second one, I just want to take a quick look at. I don't think you need to pull it up at the moment, but it was, it was um, I'm going to stop looking at you guys and look at this for a moment. It was concerns that were raised by business managers when I was when I was talking to them yesterday and last evening, um, and some of the comments were coming back to me. And I and if you don't mind, I'll just kind of read through those. There are nine. There are eight of them. And you might maybe maybe you could pull it up, Avery, and and throw that out there so they can see that too. So Would that might be more logical instead of me just strictly reading. And then I'll paraphrase them. Do you have them, Avery? Yep, sorry. Um, which document was it? That would be the second one, the business manager concerns, please. Okay, I'll pull it up in just a moment. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't find it on the education site, but I found it on the Ways and Means site. So okay. if anybody's looking for it. Um, yeah, the, the, what, what, I'll, I'll talk about the first one because I kind of know it off the top of my head. Um, um, nope, next one, Avery, not that one, if you don't mind. The first one is talking about um, do districts have to continue paying tuition? And that's a good question. <laughs> um, this, yeah, thank you. That's the right one. Um, and it's it, it, if, if everything continues, it will work out the way people expect because that's how they built their budgets. But in, in this example that I was given about Echo Valley and Payne Mountain, which are in Washington, what used to be, what they used to be called Washington. I forgot, I forget whoever it used to be called because all the changes from Act 46. Um, but this is, this is, this is, um, this is Washington and Orange and, and uh, Northfield and um, Williamstown. Um, one of them is probably, it, it, oh, I was told owes $500,000 in tuition. Another one is owed $250,000. If some, something happens, that people don't have to pay tuition, that's going to create cash flow problems for for one, um, they they're not getting five hundred thousand Echo Valley. So there's that that was one of the questions. I don't, it, to my knowledge, nothing is changing in terms of paying tuition. But it was it was a concern. It was not that was not the only concern. That was not the only person who had the concern. I just put that up there because he had numbers on that one. I thought it'd be interesting to see the numbers. Um, there was question number two or concern number two was about if they're not going to be receiving reim. Well, it, well, let me rephrase that because I'm speaking. We're not speaking clearly. Um, Question number two is, is people are using their buses now to deliver um, food. Those type costs are not, are not eligible for reimbursement. They're not eligible transportation costs as currently written in statute and state board rule. So that means that in two years when they're getting transportation aid, it'll be based on costs this year. They're not gonna have that money coming in. 
plus they're incurring the cost right now. So one of the questions was if they're not going to receive full reimbursement for transporting meals, and they asked the legislature to allow aid on the transportation costs of delivering those meals currently. So I think that's a valid point for them and something to think about um, because they are they are incurring these costs. They've got busing contracts quite often. Who those are the folks doing the driving? Uh, they've got their own bus drivers. They've got other people helping out. So they they are running into costs that currently are not allowed, will not be counted for eligible um, transportation costs. Just something to think about. Third one I kind of mentioned, um, municipal taxes, there's concern about whether they're gonna come in. Um, number four is special education reimbursement. Um, it's unclear that, that how this is all going to work. Right now, we still have to follow the federal requirements and they haven't changed yet. <clears throat> There's some concern that that some of the paraprofessionals who are one on one are not spending all their time doing special education right now. There's some concern that some of the staff are not spending full seven, eight hours, whatever it is per day on, on those things. So we're anticipating that we will get some guidance from the federal folks to answer this question. But again, it's a concern for the for the business managers right now. Um, child nutrition, they have an in-house program, so they're sending a lot more food out than before, but they're not having any money coming in. So, so that, that's an issue for them coming in. They are getting federal monies on the per, per meal basis, but it's not covering their expenses by any means. Um, number six, contract vendors, oh, this is about transportation. There, some people have contract, there's only one contractor around. If they terminate their contract because they're no longer busing kids, and the, the bus and service releases their employees, will they be back next year when they do need that service again? Uh, again, a concern for next year. Um, seven, oh, this, this is an interesting statement somebody came up with. Um, just to paraphrase it, what, what number seven is saying is that there's currently no requirement for a school district to carry a certain amount of reserves. And this is a situation where it, with the situation people find themselves could have been somewhat mitigated had they had to carry reserves. Um, so mm -hmm. that's so the question is, should that be looked at and should that length, should that be considered as a possible statutory change that a school district carries a specific percentage of their budget as a reserve on an annual basis? Um, uh, Brad, Peter's got a question. Oh. Uh, thanks, I was actually, uh, you're gonna call to me at the end because my question is back up to number two concerns about uh, transportation reimbursement. Yep. Uh, is that something that we could fix in statute? Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. If we had money, yes. <laughs> this will be two years down the road. I'm sure right. everything will be fine then. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so that was, that was number seven. And so the last one, would you jump down to eight please, Avery? Thank you very much. Um, Ah, uh, again, another tax revenue one coming if people abate property taxes due to lack of income. It's just a general question, what's going to what's do the education fund and special education reimbursement? So, I have so to, the, this, this is the one that keeps me up at night. Yes, it, it's starting to keep me up at night too. And, and I know it's keeping the business managers up at night. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can set all the tax rates we want, but if people can't pay it, they can't right. pay it. Right, right. So. So I just wanted you to be aware that these are some of the things that I had heard that were overriding concerns from people. Um, so I just tried to put, the, they're a little more organized than the other one that I threw out there. But, uh, <laughs> uh, thank thank <laughs> you for that. Um, it, it's actually really helpful to, um, especially for our committee, we don't hear from school administrators as much as the education committee does. And it's really useful to get some sense of what, um, what people are worried about. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think I don't see questions. So um, I think, Kate, are you, are you gonna introduce the next two or three speakers? You have to unmute yourself. Right, let me mute. I have to get back to the page that has my face on it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we thought it would be helpful to bring in uh, the uh, Vermont School Boards Association, as well as a couple of uh, member, uh, member boards who are uh, currently do not have uh, a budget. So 
Um, perhaps, Sue, you could help to introduce the problem to us. Um, and then we will hear from the two uh, chairs of school boards. Yes, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. I wanted to, uh, first of all, introduce myself, Sue Siglowski, Vermont School Boards Association, Executive Director, and wanted to let both of your committees know about some elections guidance um, that we received yesterday from the Secretary of State's office. So I wasn't sure if you were um, already aware of it or not, but it does affect these school budget votes that either have not occurred yet or um, that were defeated on town meeting day. So the um, elections bulletin that we received, um, it was sent to municipal clerks, but also uh, sent to the VSBA to be distributed. Um, it was requested to be distributed widely to school districts and their attorneys, which we did. Um, I can give you a summary of that bulletin. It states that the Secretary of State reached an agreement with the governor earlier this week to allow cancellation of municipal elections mandated to be held on or before a certain date. And for those who have elections coming up in April or May, the Secretary of State's guidance um, in this bulletin was to cancel those meetings if at all possible. Um, quoting here, it says, whether they are votes from the floor or Australian ballot votes that require processing and counting, the processes required at this time to conduct the election put voters and election workers at too much risk from this highly contagious virus. On the topic of budget revotes, it states that there is no time frame in election law in which a budget revote must be, re must be held for votes um, that are by that by charter article of agreement or by law are required to be held on or before a certain date. Um, it says that the governor has agreed under the authority granted to the Secretary of State in section three of H681, um, which was just signed into law on Monday um, the, to allow those elections to be canceled as well. The stated objective uh, of this bulletin was to see if votes can be conducted safely in late spring or early summer. And if that is not possible to provide time for the Secretary of State's office to devise and implement appropriate procedures to allow local elections to take place safely. So VSBA has communicated this guidance to school boards. You're going to hear today from two school board chairs about how their boards plan to proceed. I know that there's also been a question about what happens if a school district does not have an approved budget by July 1. I'm not sure if your committees have discussed, um, both discussed that yet, but um, just a, a little bit of information about that. 16 VSA section 566 authorizes the school district to borrow up to 87% of the previous year's budget if a budget has not been approved by June 30th. And this statute um, is not um, intended to penalize, it's to ensure that a district has funds, access to funds in order to begin operations on July 1. Once the electorate approves the budget, the district will have access to the full amount of the budget for that fiscal year. I do that have- so that 87% is borrowing from the local bank, correct? Yes. I do have some information on um, how many budgets um, we're talking about that, that haven't been voted on yet or haven't been approved yet. There are um, nine that were defeated on town meeting day and many of these nine had set dates to hold a second vote but have since um, canceled those votes due to the pandemic. And then there are nine that have not voted yet at all. And many of those votes were scheduled for April and May. Um, don't have a clear picture on, on what's happening with all of those. But as I said, they just received this um, elections bulletin yesterday from the Secretary of State's office. That's the information I have. Um, prepared for the committee today. Happy to answer any questions if there are any. Um, are you hearing from any of the districts with past budgets that are considering revotes? I have not heard um, uh, that that is happening. 
Our district's aware of that. That's, that's a good question. I don't know if they are aware of that. I think that they're just, with, with the change in the, um, the temporary changes in the open meeting law, I think they're just starting now to have their remote meetings. Um, that law was signed into effect on Monday. So they're, they're starting to have remote meetings now and, um, and starting to um, deal with the, the new reality caused by the pandemic. So there are nine that uh, do not hold uh, their votes uh, um, related to town meeting. Um, the rest are town meeting votes. Is that correct? Uh, there, are, I believe there are a few that even hold their votes earlier than town meeting, but most of them are, are on town meeting day. Do you know what the, their reasoning is for holding them as late as they do? I don't know what the reasoning is, no. Well, we do have the chair of one of them here, so <laughs> we can ask her. Yeah. Um, are there questions for Sue? Scrolling back and forth between these windows. I don't see any questions, so shall we go on uh, to Martha Heath, who you have not held your vote yet. That's correct. Um, I lost my video connection, so I am on the phone. Um, so should I just go ahead with my testimony? That would be great. And welcome, Martha Heath, former chair of <laughs> appropriations and member of this body. Thank you. We're, thank we're you. all waving. <laughs> Pardon? We're, we're waving to you, Martha. This is Janet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish I was still on video. I got disconnected. So, um, well, my name is Martha Heath, and I chair the Essex Westford School District Board. Thank you for inviting me to testify. Um, as Kate said, our district is one that hasn't yet focused on the school budget. Our vote was to have taken place on April 14th with our annual meeting and budget information ske session scheduled for April 13th. Um, I, we probably haven't identified all of our concerns, but I thought I would go through the things that have come up so far. Right. Um, first, obviously, uh, uh, the challenge that's created by needing to vote after the onset of this pandemic, given the financial challenges and the general unease our voters are experiencing. We're concerned about the possible ramifications for our students. Um, that will be different from perhaps from those where budgets have already passed. A second issue is while there are provisions in law for accessing money if the school budget is not passed by July 1st, it is obviously preferable to have one in place. As you've heard, the latest guidance from the Secretary of State's office is not to hold votes of any kind in April or May. This may make it difficult to have a budget in place by July 1st. Um, third, um, we're wondering if we should continue to use the yield projections that came out in December to project tax rates associated with the proposed budget. Um, if not, well, when will the final yields for FY21 be set? Um, it would seem unfair for us to have to use different numbers than those that 
um, voted on town meeting day yet we don't know if the projections are realistic at this point and our taxpayers could um, could question them um, so we're curious as to whether the state will be giving us guidance the fourth issue for us is that in our particular particular district, the vast majority of our projected tax increase comes from a significant drop in CLAs for our communities. Um, we're concerned about how folks, how folks react to their houses being deemed to be much more valuable under our dramatically changed fiscal circumstances. Um, I don't know that that's a problem that has any solution to it, but it's certainly out there for us. Um, in Westford, for instance, the tax rate, projected tax rate increase is 8% for those who pay both solely based on property. Um, but our Budget is only going up 1.3 percent. <throat> My fifth issue is also one that I don't think the legislature can help with, but it's on our minds. Much of our school budget is made up of personnel costs. RIF notices are due on April 15th. It feels like it would be very detrimental to send RIF notices at this time. Our teachers are doing extraordinary work, and it would feel like a slap in the face, I think. Um, I have three other issues that are probably more for Gaza Ops than these two committees, but I thought I would make you aware of them. Um, just as I said, as what said earlier, the Secretary of State's office is recommending we not hold the annual meeting or budget vote in April or May. When we do hold a meeting, it cannot take place for 30 to 40 days from the date of the warning. We're wondering if the warning period should be shortened in this extraordinary time. Um, also, um, we're wondering if it would be possible to hold the annual meeting and the budget information session via some teleconferencing application. Um, we think it's going to be hard to gather people to meet those, that requirement. Most of the annual meeting business can be converted to Australian ballot items, and we will likely do that. But school districts have to hold budget information sessions, so we're curious about that. And finally, the legislation that was just signed allows for conducting a vote entirely by Australian ballot. Um, that would be quite expensive. We're going to ask us, us if it would be possible to conduct a vote entirely by Australian ballot, but still require voters to request ballots. The last thing that I want to bring up is not specifically related to the fact that we don't have, haven't voted on the budget yet, but we wondered if you were starting to think about 
the impact of learning from home for the remainder of the school year and what that may require in additional resources to get some students ready for starting school again next fall, assuming that school can start. <laughs> um, so I'll just close by saying thank you so much for helping us to consider the issues that are raised for our school district and districts like us. And I'm happy to answer questions. Um, uh, Kate, yeah. if, if I could jump in on the question about um, what, what the state might do and when, um, just to respond to that, we're, we're, we, don't, we have no information. We have as little information as you do. Um, we also have um, issues about how we, how we're able to vote. You know, when when it is that the legislature is going to be able to actually take mm -hmm. um, a formal action. As you probably know, we're sort of working our way along through that. Um, the, our committee hasn't talked about it, and it's something that we should talk about about whether there are different rules that apply to districts that haven't adopted their budgets than the rules that were in place for those that did. Um, but I think my sort of starting place is that, um, that that you should assume those same rules are in place for you as they were for everybody else, just because I'm not sure that we're going to be in a position to change them. Um, and if particularly with respect to the CLA, I'm not sure that it would be equitable to change them. So that's just off the top of my head. Other committee members may have other thoughts about it. Um, and I'm happy to have them weigh in if they do, but you raise really good questions and uh, something that our committee will continue to look at. Thanks. I'm looking to see if there's anybody else at the moment. We'll probably want to be um, keeping in touch with you, Martha, as we okay. go forward. Um, we are in, you may have noticed, some rather unusual times. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's putting a mildly. <laughs> and I think that you're probably correct in saying uh, using the December forecast probably is no longer accurate. Okay. So, so thank you. Um, we also hear uh, we also have um, Tim Smith, who's chair of the Slate Valley Union uh, Unified School District Board. Um, Tim, welcome. Yes, I'm. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, I was invited to testify today because unfortunately I am one of the nine districts uh, who's, who doesn't have a, a school uh, budget currently because our vote did go down on town meeting day. Um, I've got uh, a, a set list of, of talking points here. Uh, some of these have already been touched on by Brad and Mark. Uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions during the way, or you can hold your questions to the end. But um, quickly, just to introduce uh, myself again, my name is Tim Smith. Uh, I'm a CPA. I work for a public accounting firm in Rutland, Vermont. Uh, my wife uh, is a teacher. Uh, fortunately for us, we're both able to work from home. Uh, we do have two boys, ages 12 and 9. And like everyone else out there, we're adjusting to this new normal of both working from home and teaching from home. Um, before our district consolidated, I served on the Castleton School Board for six years. Two of those were as chair, and this is my second year as a board member on the Unified Slate Valley Union School Board. Um, just so everyone is familiar where we're located in the state, we're in western Rutland County along the Route 4 corridor. Uh, we're made up of six towns, uh, Castleton, Hubberton, Fairhaven, Westhaven, Benson, and Orwell. We service 1,261 kids, 364 of which uh, attend our district high school in Fairhaven. Uh, so again, as I had mentioned previously, our, our budget went down on town meeting day. Um, it was a close vote, 52% uh, no, 48% yes. Uh, I think the problem that we experienced was our vote, our vote was held in conjunction with a very large construction bond for 
$59.5 million. So as you can expect, there was a, that was certainly a, a, a hot topic of, of debate in our community. And um, certainly there was some negative backlash from the bond vote that affected our school budget vote. Uh, just to put things in context, the school bond vote went down 78 points to 22 points. So around 904 voters or 36% who voted no on the bond did support our, our school budget. So if you had asked me two or three weeks ago if I felt confident that a revote would be successful, I would certainly say yes, we weren't that far off to begin with, but now, given the development and the situation at hand, uh, no one can be sure what the uh, pulse of the electorate is. Uh, everyone's really concerned about just putting food on the table and keeping themselves and their families safe in these times. Um, so I've got a few concerns I wanted to address today. Um, some of them are just general COVID related concerns. And some of them are concerns related to the logistics of our budget revote. So why don't I start with the budget revote concerns. And again, some of those have already been spoken to. I do realize that there was some new legislation signed into law here just in the past couple of days. So some of our concerns might be uh, alleviated, but um, nonetheless, um, our concerns would be you know, is it reasonable for us to expect to be able to have an in-person vote along with the required public meeting uh, in advance of the end of June? Uh, I think we'd all agree probably not likely at this point. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, what's required for us to have a mail-in ballot? Now, I know according to the, the legislation here that the, the governor now has the power to designate the Secretary of State to allow that to happen. And I guess we would just wanna know when they might choose to um, make that designation to allow that to happen, uh, because certainly there's a lot of logistics that would have to take place between now and then to put that mail-in process in place, both for uh, representatives of the school district and, and the town clerks in our various towns. So we wanna get a budget passed. That's priority number one. I, I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, cash flow wise through the rest of this year, but uh, certainly if we had a budget for 21, uh, that would take a lot of the stress off the table for myself and certainly administration and business managers. So if we could have guidance from the governor or secretary of state sooner or later, whether or not we're gonna do a mail-in ballot so we can put that in place um, because it certainly is still our intent to pass a school budget by that June 30 deadline. Um, a couple concerns with the revote, and this was spoken to previously by Brad, I believe, or actually it was Mark, but um, per terms of our master agreement with the NEA, um, we have to give reduction in force notices to our employees by March 15th. That deadline has already passed. So certainly if we are in a position where we have to make drastic cuts to our budget, uh, one of the tools that we would have, reducing staff, uh, we don't have that tool anymore. Um, we don't want to reduce staff for obvious reasons. I don't really think we have the room to reduce staff any further than we already have over the past several years. But in any event, that, that's not a tool. Someone had spoken previously that 80% of our costs are personnel and healthcare. So if we're forced to make big cuts and we can't make cuts to personnel, where else do we have to cut? R really nowhere. It would be dramatic cuts that would have a significant impact on. Uh, student programming and the quality of our education. Um, pause, any questions? Are there any questions? All right, uh, hearing none, then uh, just some general COVID related concerns. Uh, again, number one, cash flow. Uh, I, I think we're going to be okay, but after speaking with uh, our business manager this morning, Cheryl Scarzello, certainly we are expecting that last payment from the education fund sometime this spring. And uh, I believe our share for that is going to be around $2.6 million. Uh, that's a concern. And then transportation reimbursement. This has been talked about previously. Um, we were expecting $159,000 uh, transportation reimbursement this spring, but of course uh, there are no uh, activities. There's no uh, pickup of students. 
Um, we're using our buses right now to deliver meals, but someone had mentioned previously that those are not gonna be reimbursable expenses. Um, so that would be a concern, at least the transportation piece of our reimbursement. Um, another concern is our bus contractor, Brad, you, you must have spoken to Cheryl recently, but um, you know, the viability of any business right now is, is in question. And with our particular bus contractor, uh, there's not a lot of competition. They're one of the few providers in our, our area, at least, maybe the state. If their future viability is in question, then we could be in a, in a world of hurt, not only the remainder of this year, but certainly next year with uh, student transportation. Um, Brad mentioned uh, healthcare transition costs. Uh, in particular, in Rutland County, obviously, we've heard GE Aviation is laying off 60% of its workforce at the Rutland plants. Uh, per Vermont Digger, that's approximately 1,400 jobs total before the reduction. But uh, they're certainly a huge employer for our area in Rutland County. And uh, this idea of uh, healthcare transition, people who previously were uh, under the coverage of a spouse, that employer has now uh, laid them off. Are they going to transition themselves, their family members, to the healthcare policy of the school, which is certainly a very generous policy, as you know? Uh, that could have big, big costs for our, our school districts. Uh, something that hasn't been touched on, so I'll take credit for this one, is the, is the social services. As you guys are all aware, uh, schools continue to provide an increasing menu of social services traditionally provided by other government agencies. And undoubtedly, this situation at hand will require additional monies from a school budget for a guidance counselors, therapists, behavior interventionists, and school-based clinicians. So, you know, social services, mental health, that's a big thing right now. And that's one of the things that I'm struggling with as a parent personally is you know, it's one thing to, to manage the schoolwork and the school load. I, I think we're doing okay with that, but the untold story is really how this is gonna affect our, our kids' minds. How, how are they doing on the inside, not being able to connect with their friends and doing all the things that they're used to being, uh, they're used to doing. Um, so I've kind of impressed upon our superintendent that I, I hope that we prioritize the mental health aspect of things more so than the academic progress. These are extraordinary times. We're, we're not gonna be able to check off every academic progress checkbox. I, I think we need to focus on the mental health of our kids. Um, and with that said, I don't really have anything else for you. Um, I appreciate the time and the opportunity to testify. Uh, we're all in this together and uh, I will take any questions anyone might have. Questions? So I'm hearing a, a number of, of issues, um, some simple, some quite complex. Um, mm -hmm. Simpler things are reduction in force notice, um, transportation fund reimbursement, uh, voting challenges. Then there's predicting tax rates. What do you do if you don't have a budget? And what are we gonna be doing going forward? Um, we're gonna be needing your voice at the table as we uh, look to solve, come up with solutions to some of the problems that we're facing. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of uncertainty, but for me, it's the mail-in ballot. I mean, I, one thing at a time, control what you can control. If we knew right now that we could not vote in person and instead we were gonna vote by mail, we could certainly put those mechanisms in place to start that process. And I know the governor has the ability to, to do that. So I would just like some clarity on that. That would be something that we could control right away. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Janet, I think you're handing it to you. Uh, are you handing it to me? Is uh, Jeff Fannin, I think is next on my okay. list. Jeff, are you here? I am. Hello, Hi. hello. Oh, there you are. Um, okay. So. Hi. Uh, I'm going to start where uh, Tim just finished and off. Let me, let me just jump in just so people know what we're doing. We're going to listen to Jeff and then we have Karen Horn and that and that's it for the witnesses for people who are having trouble pulling it up. Um, that's that's what, what we're that's the rest of our afternoon. So Jeff, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, no worries. Um, for the record, Jeff Fannin, Vermont. 
Um, thank you for having me here today and listening to me and happy to answer any questions at the end. Uh, I'm going to start where uh, uh, Tim Smith just finished off, which is, I think, a great segue, um, which is teachers, parents, administrators, everybody's doing their level best to educate students. And, um, and that's right now. And, and, it, and it's not education as we might typically know it in a brick and mortar school. And so I think we need to lower our expectations uh, as to what we can actually accomplish and look ahead to what, what we will need to do come next September, hopefully, when we return to a normal school setting in, inside the school. So we will find out that kids today are, are having a whole lot of host of needs that aren't being met and they will come out uh, in weird and different and strange ways that we just can't predict right now when they return to school in September. So I think looking ahead, that is going to be a big issue. And I think Tim is absolutely right. Um, this is uh, something pretty unique that we've got to figure out and, how to, and we'll have to figure out how to deal with come next school year. Um, so I, I appreciate him re raising that issue. It's, it's, um, it's something I think we need to be mindful of, no doubt. Um, so, uh, you know, we also, you also heard from Sue earlier talk about the, uh, uh, the school voting and Tim mentioned it as well. And, and, and uh, I think that's really important. So I won't touch on it, but uh, just know that we're also aware that getting schools to approve their budgets uh, is, is important for, for them and for us and for the entire state. So we appreciate that work that the secretary has issued guidelines in late, you know, late May or June, before we should do a voting and and uh, you know whether we can do that by mail or not. It's a good good uh, idea to get clarified. Jeff, Jeff, um, you've got callous broadband and you're disappearing at least for me a little bit. Maybe you, maybe if you close your video, we can hear you more cl more clearly. It actually, I think it might be you, Janet. <laughs> good, that makes me feel better. It's still callous broadband. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Last time it was Jeff. Go quickly. But... Quickly, this is a real example. So I've got uh, both the remote. Okay, it's definitely Jeff. <laughs> I have it. <laughs> I think he'll come there. back. Yeah, better. Um, well, see, I mean, we're, you know, this is what parents are dealing with all the time and their kids uh, <laughs> in schools and teachers. Am I lost again? No, Sorsha just sent me a note that I was right. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as usual, Janet. Um, so I, it so sounds like to us, uh, it's, School budgets and finances are pretty well in hand, and I'll, I'll try to speed up here a little bit. Um, and I think we're looking ahead now to next year. Um, and so we don't think it's advisable. We don't think it's um, necessary right now uh, to be looking to make major changes to the education funding system. I know there's a, a, always a groundswell for that, um, but we think that given all the changes, that we're encountering today, overlaid with, uh, you've got the waiting study that was just barely being discussed in the state house a couple of weeks ago before you closed, um, as well as Act 173, which is the special education block grant funding law. Um, we think there's a lot of change going on, throw into the mix the, um, uh, the pandemic and the results thereof, uh, we think that we need to just slow down, take a deep breath, get our sea legs about us and the whole educational system as a whole, and not, make, not look to make dramatic changes uh, in this time of dramatic change for other reasons. So there's a lot going on. Uh, and I think that it would be critical, we think it's critical to get um, clarity sooner rather than later as it relates to the yield. And if you could set that before July 1, I think that would be helpful. I know there's a lot of talk about what this, uh, a short budget and then coming back in the fall or something. 
that makes if, if you're going to get into education funding then in the fall that's changing funding strings and levers while schools are operating in that fiscal year and i think that's really not a good thing to do so we would recommend that, hope that you would make the yield known well before july 1 uh, and certainly no later then because that's the start of the fiscal year for schools jeff i've got a couple of questions peter sure. and then caleb yep uh jeff uh, seeing as how things change day to day right now um if if something as radical as you know the governor or the secretary of education said you know something we're just going to end school at the end of april and we'll start august 1st and have a longer school year next year in order to make up for lost education this year how much of an obstacle will collective bargaining agreements be with, with something like that um a, I don't know. <laughs> you know that seems um, highly speculative, but uh, certainly that would have an enormous effect on people's lives. Uh, and I'm not, you know, the the devil is in the details there, right? So, you know, and beginning when number one, and start and then ending as well. You know, so we don't know. If you're going to start at a normal time in end of August, let's say September one for after Labor Day, you know, go go into that argument, um, and then finishing. I, I don't know when. So when, when your hypothetical is, so I'm I'm speculating, but is Jeff? Is there a problem? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Get out. Yes. <laughs> Jeff, um, yes. It, uh, you have to turn off the video again. I'm sorry. Um, That's fine. We're we're losing it again. Yeah. Uh, so, Peter, I, Representative Collin, I think that that collective bargaining has certainly will be uh, an issue, but we've got to, we've gotten through a lot of thick problems before, and I think we can get through that one. Uh, Caleb, Caleb, where are you? Let me unmute. There we go. Um, so. Jeff, I'm just curious, um, have you heard at all from your membership whether um, there, are, because of course school staff have been instructed to, to report to work and I know they're doing a, a ton of very valuable work right now. At the same time, we're kind of hearing that um, since there is sort of broad allowance for um, claiming unemployment insurance because of needing to isolate in this time. Uh, we're seeing that in some private industry um, that individuals are, are electing to basically get unemployment insurance at, you know, as an option at this time to isolate. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing any signs of that or anything like that within your membership where folks are saying, you know what, I am going to isolate during this time. And in fact, um, you know, essentially claim unemployment insurance. I don't know, maybe I'm incorrect, maybe that's not allowable in this situation, but I'm just kind of curious if that's a, a trend at all that's developing. I have not heard of that at all being a trend. In fact, I would hear, Representative Elder, I would, I, I've heard the opposite. I've heard people are working day and night um, trying to figure out how to go online, how to teach kids, how to uh, respond to parents. So I'm hearing from my We lost you, Jeff. You still there? Well, I think I got the. I think I got the okay. there. And I appreciate that. Thank okay. you. Uh, Jim Maslin has a question. Yeah, thanks, um, Jeff. Just to comment, I don't expect an answer right away. Um, with regards to remote learning, online learning, I guess you people are as well aware as much as anybody of how different people, different children in particular, have different learning styles. Some are kinesthetic. Some are visual. Some are auditory um, and I would just urge you all as you work your way through this to see what you could do to address different learning styles in children so some who maybe used to do well in the classroom are not going to do well at home and I don't expect uh, an easy answer just thank you for looking into it so uh, could not agree more and I would also add too that teachers uh, likewise teach differently online 
versus in class. And so um, we're experiencing some folks who are quite dynamic online and, and others who are great teachers in the classroom who are struggling to get online and put their, their material online. So it's, it's both and students learn differently and we're gonna have to make up for that come next year. And Jeff, you have been participating uh, with the agency on the continuity of education and learning, correct? Uh, it, it, mostly, yes, but it could be better and, and, and uh, meeting to both the sector of education. Uh, I, I'll just say here, we have con real concerns with the continuity of learning plan template that was issued yesterday that it lacks uh, any information that avoid parent voice and student voice in the i think callus has just dropped off sorry and this is this is certainly what we're hearing in our committee and in terms of the challenges for uh remote learning yeah i'm sorry I don't know if it's, it seems to get worse in the afternoon. <laughs> we'll have to schedule you next time in the morning then. I don't know. <laughs> um, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll stay. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the connection. That's not your fault. So are we. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so uh, Avery tells me that she's unlocking the meeting just enough to get uh, Karen Horn on. Um, and she's our last um, last witness. So let me know, Avery, when she's here. We can begin. All right, Karen, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I this is Karen Horn with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And thank you for having me um, to your committees. I did send in a memo to both the House Ways and Means Committee and the Education Committee this morning. And I think that you mostly wanted to talk about um, the homestead filing deadline and potential for delaying some of those deadlines. Yes, Is that's that correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, we've just had a similar conversation actually in the Senate Finance Committee not too long ago. The, um, the homestead filing deadline being delayed to July 15th is going to um, create a bit of an issue in the rest of the calendar, which I'm sure you've already been discussing. Um, we did talk in the Finance Committee about the potential for towns delaying their tax due dates if it doesn't cause a cash flow problem for them. I think we, um, we are not thinking that separating the municipal tax bill and the education tax bill is a good idea this year um, because of everything else that's going on and people won't be expecting it. Um, and one of the other uh, proposals that was floated by Carol Dawes and the tax department is that we proceed as um, we would have ordinarily with uh, homestead filings and just understand that as a lot of them would be coming in late, the, um, there would be a lot of corrections, corrected tax bills to be sent out during the course of the next few months. So those are all kinds of things that we have been talking about. Um, I don't know, and and I should probably have a better idea, but I don't know if having a variety of, you know, some towns going with um, their regular July deadlines and other towns delaying them, if that creates problems for the tax department. I think it doesn't, but I'm not really sure about that. So it is a continuing issue that we're trying to work on. We did have a conversation with the state treasurer um, in the bond bank uh, the other day. And for those payments that um, would be coming to towns um, this year, uh, there is some thinking that there might be funds 
to cover short payments for those municipalities before July 1. So um, I, we're going to revisit that issue, I believe, next week, Monday. But um, there might be some, you know, opportunity as the uh, state did during Tropical Storm Irene to cover at least that portion in the short term. I don't know if people have questions or uh, that's a little bit disjointed. No, it's fine, Karen. Um, we're sort of keeping track of questions and we've, we've tended to just interrupt if we see them. So, um, so I don't think there's any right this minute. Okay. Um, if, if people had a, have a chance to read the, the memo that I sent off this morning, it's more organized than I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's sort of where we are at, at this very moment. We also just, so you are aware, we had a um, request from the Appropriations Committee this morning to get them some information about what municipal needs are right now as a result of the COVID crisis and the stay home, stay safe executive orders. So I'm putting that together this afternoon um, for that committee and we can send it to you as well if you're interested. That'd be great, thank you. Um, I know our committee heard from you, I can't remember what day it was, not very long ago. Um, so some of this is is repeat for us, but let me see if anyone has any, any questions that they wanna ask. Um, uh, Kate does, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Um, I don't have a hand raised, but I'm sorry. Um, uh, Karen, thank you. Um, municipal taxes and um, education taxes obviously um, are, are quite different. One being more state focused, one being more local focused. And at the moment, looking at the various differences in dates and timing and when taxes are collected and seeing that there's, you know, some districts have, have only, given half of their contribution. Um, is there comfort going forward at some point, not, not today, <laughs> but to, to rethink that? I mean, as we know, a, a crisis often points out weaknesses in the system. And I'm, one, I, I'm personally viewing this as a weakness in the system and wondering um, your thoughts on that matter. In, in terms of uh, dividing the municipal tax in the education tax billing? Is that what you're thinking about? And some consistency in dates and collection. Yes, separating it, there are a variety of ways you, you can separate it, um, but, but really looking at a consistent, uh, consistent dates. Oh, of... so, um, so municipalities um, set their uh, tax due dates either at town meeting or um, at, in their charters, a lot of them are set in their charters. And you're right, they are, um, they are sort of all over the map. A number of towns have installments for tax states. And the reason that you have installments really is to make it easier for people to pay um, throughout the year. So I don't, I don't know that um, we, I don't know that we would think it's a good idea to have the same tax um, tax due dates for property taxes across the board. I don't know that it would actually have solved this problem because it sort of depends when in the year your pandemic falls. But um, so, so that's an interesting concept. I mean, we do have a lot of concerns right now about the penalties that are in law if a town ends up making a late education um, property tax payment, they're pretty severe. And I think they were put in place with the um, thinking that towns were willfully refusing to do that, to make those payments. That's entirely not the case right now. Education property taxes are usually um, in most smaller towns, by far the majority of the property taxes that you pay and towns would not be able to make the education fund whole. So that's a real concern for us 
right now. And yet this was all, the, the current way that they are collected is pretty much pre-Act 6068, when everything was pretty municipally def defined. Municipality. Um, well, you know, we have discussed uh, over the years uh, separating the education and, and municipal tax billing and having the municipal municipalities bill for municipal taxes and the state bill for education taxes. There's all kinds of issues with that. And um, it's not a it, it's not a change that I think we could tackle right now at all. But it's a conversation worth having again once we get on the other side of this. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Karen I, and Kate, both of you. I, I, I agree with that. I don't think there's any way in the world we could do it now, among other things that the tax department uh, couldn't manage it um, and it's too much change. And I don't think that's what Kate was suggesting, but I yeah. think she was suggesting that it was a conversation that maybe we could have when we get to the other side of this. It, it sounds like that's where- Oh, we're happy to do that. We are happy yeah. to do that. Yeah. Good. Um, I don't see other questions at the moment. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add, Karen? Uh, no, not right now. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, so I think we're I think we're ready to close our meeting. Um, I just see if there are any last questions or last words. Just for my own committee, I don't know yet what the schedule is for next week. Um, if you would, in your busy schedules, running out and doing all the kinds of things you get to do, um, please hold 10 o'clock. Um, and that's what I'll aim for, but I don't know what it's gonna be um, next week. I need, to, I need to reassess. And apparently um, I think the speaker is gonna assign times to us again because of the um, uh, difficulty with security on the system. Um, so uh, any, any last words, Kate? Oh, I thank you. I uh, really appreciated being able to do this jointly and hear some of the questions from your committee, um, having a, a perspective a little different from what our committee brings yeah. um, no. and yet trying to solve the same problem. It was great. Um, I appreciate it and appreciate everybody's forbearance and um, uh, we will, um, we'll, we will keep working at this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So who signs off? Everybody's waving, but I don't know who's, who terminates. Somebody does. Avery terminates, I suppose. All right. Well.